The woman in the wedding dress takes off her underwear, throws it onto Huang Mao's body. She lures the other person to the second floor bed. Huang Mao takes off his clothes and pounces. Unexpectedly, after the incident, the woman denies everything. She claims she was altering clothes all night. A mysterious handmade wedding dress, involving several bizarre cases. This drama is adapted from real stories told by the famous radio program Supernatural Tuesday. Eight horror stories directed by eight directors will bring you an unexpected experience of fear. The first story The Wedding Dress. Xiao Miao started working at a bridal shop. The shop is divided into five floors in total. The first floor is the display and sales area. The second floor is the old clothes storage room. There is also an old sewing machine placed there, used for repairing or altering wedding dresses. The third floor is a storage room. It is filled with a pile of things. The fourth floor is a photography studio, where bridal photos can be taken. The top floor is Xiao Miao's employee dormitory. The bridal shop's opening hours are from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., closed on Mondays. Boss Hua Jie is going to Phuket for four to five days. During this time, the shop is entrusted to Xiao Miao to look after. In the evening, a train passes by, blowing away the talisman attached to the water tank. Meanwhile, Xiao Miao is talking to her mother on the phone. She explains that she has switched to a higher paying job and will send an extra 3,000 baht home every month. Her mother nags on the phone. She warns Xiao Miao not to try on wedding dresses casually, or she'll never get married. Her mother starts to complain. The neighbor Xiao Nan found a good husband and is about to move abroad. Xiao Miao, on the other hand, is in a relationship with a delivery man. How will she support the whole family in the future? Xiao Miao was about to argue with her mother, but felt someone following her. However, when she turned around to check, there was only an empty corridor behind her. The next day, a couple came to see wedding dresses. The woman was not satisfied after looking, and the man next to her was getting impatient. He asked if she wanted to go to another store. Xiao Miao quickly said, There is still inventory upstairs. Let me go up and check for you. However, the items stacked in the storage room are all old styles. At that moment, Xiao Miao noticed the short skirt on the model. The craftsmanship of the clothes was very delicate. The female customer was very satisfied, but the size was not right. She hoped Xiao Miao could enlarge the skirt, but it was a big project. It would take at least four to six weeks to complete. The female customer was getting married next week and hoped Xiao Miao could make the alteration within a week. The customer was very angry and immediately started recording a video on her phone. She said that the staff at this bridal shop called her a fat pig. Xiao Miao looked innocent. She genuinely didn't know she had said those words. However, to protect the reputation of the bridal shop, Xiao Miao stopped the female customer and promised to alter the wedding dress within a week, offering a discounted price. The female customer was very satisfied with the wedding dress, so she suppressed her anger and went back to have her measurements taken again. Xiao Miao accepted the order, so she had to work overtime to alter the measurements. Suddenly, there was a loud noise coming from upstairs. Xiao Miao grabbed a pair of scissors and went up to investigate. It turned out that the set in the photography studio had fallen over. As she was about to go and prop it back up, she noticed a human figure reflected in the cloth behind her. Xiao Miao approached, and the person behind her was her boyfriend, Bank. <laughs> Bank said he had come to find Xiao Miao just now. Someone in a wedding dress came to the door, even intentionally took off their underwear to seduce him. Bank then followed Xiao Miao to the photography studio to fool around. Unexpectedly, the other party, after taking off the wedding dress, denied everything. Xiao Miao was very confused. She has been changing clothes in the old clothing warehouse and has never done the things that Bank said. Her boyfriend stepped forward wanting to take action, but Xiao Miao was not in the mood. She asked Bank when they would get married. Her mother has called several times urging them, but Bank is poor and cannot come up with a bride price. He also does not have money to hold a luxurious wedding. After Bank lost his temper and left Xiao Miao, he refused to answer calls or messages the next day. Xiao Miao suddenly felt nauseous and vomited a clump of hair. She went back upstairs to continue altering the wedding dress, but saw a skinny woman wearing the same dress. Shortly after, Xiao Miao woke up from a dream, clutching a bottle of weight loss pills in her hand. Anxious, she continued working, but accidentally pricked her finger. Xiao Miao spent a lot of time altering the clothes and finally delivered them before the deadline. The female customer was shocked to see her. In just a few days, this staff member had aged so much. The female customer was a bit embarrassed. 
worried that she had pushed too hard, but the guilt quickly disappeared, because the wedding dress still didn't fit well. It was even a size smaller than before alterations. The female customer was very angry, and demanded that Xiao Miao help her take off the dress. The dress clung to the female customer like a shackle, and in panic, Xiao Miao saw a ghostly face, she collapsed unconscious on the ground, and when she woke up again, it was already dark, the couple had already left, and the discarded wedding dress lay on the floor. Xiao Miao grabbed her phone, and discovered that the female customer had already livestreamed. The next moment, the boss called to hold her accountable. Xiao Miao wanted to explain, that ever since she found that wedding dress, strange things had been happening in the store. In the time she turned away, the wedding dress on the floor disappeared. Before fainting, Xiao Miao remembered hearing the female ghost, who called herself Abi. The boss's tone changed drastically upon hearing this name. She asked Xiao Miao to wait in the store, as she would come over immediately. Xiao Miao searched everywhere for the wedding dress, during this time, but she was pushed aside by the female ghost. The cabinet in front of her was open, revealing Bank's body. It turned out, that after their argument that day, Xiao Miao had chased after Bank, and stabbed him to death with scissors, then hid the body in the cabinet. Strangely, she had forgotten about this incident. Xiao Miao turned around, and saw the wedding dress floating in midair. Shortly after, Sister Hua returned. She cautiously made her way to the second floor, and saw a woman in a wedding dress standing ahead. <laughs> the woman under the wedding dress was indeed Abi, who was originally an employee at Sister Hua's shop, and had excellent skills in altering wedding dresses, despite creating numerous beautiful dresses. But she had no chance of getting into these beautiful wedding dresses, due to her obesity. In order to fulfill her dream, Abi decided to undergo liposuction and plastic surgery at the hospital. Before long, she finally achieved a devilish figure and could fit into any wedding dress in the world. However, Abi suffered from severe weight anxiety. Whenever she gained a little weight, she would resort to taking weight loss pills and inducing vomiting. The side effects of the medication made Abi even more sensitive, leading her into a vicious cycle. Until one day, she finally reached her breaking point. <laughs> Sister Hua wanted to persuade Abi to stop taking medication, and argued that clothes were meant to serve people, so why couldn't they be altered to fit her size? In the midst of their struggle, they tore the wedding dress to shreds. Abi grabbed Sister Hua and wouldn't let go. In a moment of crisis, Sister Hua grabbed a pair of scissors and stabbed Abi. Shockingly, she killed Abi. The boss's wife hurriedly hid the body in a water tank, and locked it securely. Unexpectedly, a malevolent force broke the seal. At this moment, Abi, having killed Sister Hua, possessed Xiao Miao, intending to fulfill her dream wedding. The second story is titled Our Little Sister. Several years ago, Xiao Mei was in a car accident, and consequently developed post-traumatic stress disorder. She had recurring dreams, and even felt that reality was distorted. Xiao Mei couldn't live a normal life, but her mother's condition was even more severe than hers. Her mother often forgot that her daughter, Xiao Ai, had died in the car accident and would even prepare breakfast for her. Her mother's condition fluctuated, and she even refused to take medication. Xiao Mei was extremely worried. One day, her mother had someone buy a doll. That resembled Xiao Ai. The master claimed to have performed a ritual, to transfer Xiao Ai's soul into the doll, and left some instructions. First, she must feed the doll, and it must not miss any of the three meals a day. Second, before midnight, she must put the doll back in the box without fail ensuring that she does not miss this deadline. Lastly, she must not take the doll outside the area marked by the sacred thread, as doing so will break the binding spell. Xiaomei didn't expect her mother to go to such lengths, and she felt deeply guilty. If that day, she hadn't insisted on her mother letting her drive, the accident might not have happened. Her friend advised Xiaomei not to dwell on it, as the accident had already occurred and thinking about it further wouldn't change anything. Besides, Xiao Ai surely wouldn't blame her. Suddenly, the light in the room flickered. Xiao Mei turned to look at the door, feeling a bit uneasy. At that moment, voices could be heard coming from downstairs. Xiao Mei went to investigate. She discovered that the doll was watching TV, but the screen only displayed static. Xiao Mei turned off the TV. What <laughs> Mom scolded Xiao Mei for not sensible, while her sister was still watching the show, asking why she turned off the TV. Xiao Mei looked at this deep mother-daughter bond scene, 
Feeling extremely anxious, her own illness wasn't severe, but her mother's condition was worse than hers. Her friend Tom suggested that if the doll could make her mother happy, Xiaomei shouldn't shatter her illusions. However, Xiaomei did not heed the advice. At midnight, while her mother was asleep, she took the box containing the doll and went to the courtyard. Ignoring the master's instructions to take the doll out, the doll indeed turned into her sister. Xiao Ai immediately leaped into Xiao Mei's arms, saying she didn't want to die, and that she was just too lonely. <laughs> From their conversation, it is evident that the mother has never liked Xiao Mei, because she was her husband's favorite child, and that man ran off with another woman, leading her to vent her anger on Xiao Mei. Xiao Ai let out a painful scream, blood soaking through her snowy white dress. The next second, Xiao Mei woke up from the dream, wiping off the cold sweat from her body. She noticed that her pet bird, Gigi, was missing. Xiao Mei hurried downstairs to look for it. She saw her mother standing at the kitchen counter cutting something and approached her, asking if she had seen Gigi. However, her mother responded coldly, saying she hadn't seen it, and continued cutting vegetables. Xiao Mei caught sight of a medicine bottle in the trash can and blamed her mother for not taking her medicine on time. <laughs> Xiao Mei grabbed Xiao Ai and rushed outside, intending to throw her out of the yard. The mother hurriedly followed to stop her. The two struggled and tore the doll's dress apart, revealing strange incantations and symbols on it. The mother pushed Xiao Mei away and took the doll back. <laughs> On the other side, Xiao Mei couldn't stand being in this household. She packed her bags, planning to leave while her mother wasn't paying attention. Suddenly, someone attacked her from behind, using a drugged handkerchief to make Xiao Mei unconscious. That night, amidst thunder and lightning, Xiao Mei woke up to find herself tied to the dining table. The mother then approached with a pot of soup, divide meals for two children. Xiao Mei was shocked to see Gigi's head floating in the soup bowl. The mother scooped up a spoonful of meat soup and brought it to Xiao Mei's mouth. She struggled desperately, causing the spoon to shatter. Unexpectedly, this action angered the mother. <coughs> Xiao Mei realized her mother had gone mad. She struggled desperately while the mother was away. However, before she could free herself, the mother returned to the dining room with insecticide. She felt that Xiao Ai had been too lonely during this period, and believed that as family members, they should be by each other's side. <laughs> she held the remaining half cup, intending to feed it to her daughter. Xiao Mei struggled fiercely, pushing her away. She freed herself from the ropes and ran away. The candlestick on the table was knocked over, igniting the tablecloth. The mother rushed towards Xiao Mei with a knife in hand. Xiao Mei grabbed the blade. With her bare hands to protect herself, she endured the pain and kicked her mother away. <laughs> Xiao Mei wanted to destroy the doll, but it was not there by the dining table. Just as she was puzzled, a pair of hands suddenly reached out. Xiao Mei was pinned down by Xiao Ai, and in a critical moment, the mother rushed over and stabbed her to death. She instructed Xiao Mei to throw away the doll. Xiao Mei grabbed the doll and ran towards the yard. Crossing beyond the boundary of the sacred line, Xiao Mei saw Xiao Ai in a daze. She realized the wounds on her hands were gone, and the parrot Gigi was safe in its cage. Xiao Mei looked around and noticed two dolls beside her. Do you still remember the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder? Repeatedly dreaming or feeling reality distorted. In reality, Xiao Mei's mother and sister both died in that car accident. It was actually Xiao Mei herself who worsened. Her condition by not taking medication. She was the one using the dolls to comfort her pain, and even the friend named Tum whom she imagined. Everything was her self-deception, unwilling to face reality. The third story is called Family Him. Arwen and his friends were having a party at home, when he was reported for drug use. When the police came to search the villa, they found a sum of dirty money. It turned out that Arwen's father, Jegua, was a senior police officer who got involved in a bribery case related to a casino. The family of four moved to a house in the countryside to avoid trouble. Arwen discovered a room here that was sealed with a talisman and chain shut. In the evening, as he lay down to rest, his thoughts lingered on that room. Arwen searched for keys to unlock the room, but none of them fit. He shook the door handle, accidentally tearing the talisman. Immediately after, 
There was a sound of impact behind the door, and a ghostly figure with long hair approached. Just then, Linda, the sister, was about to return to her room, when the door inexplicably locked. Seeing her brother holding the key, she woke up the dazed Arwen, and then picked up the key to unlock the door. Strangely, the door that was tightly locked just now was now open. The next morning, the hostess Anna tidied up the wardrobe, throwing her husband's uniform on the bed, and hanging up her flight attendant uniform. In reality, Anna complained about the trouble caused by her husband, which led to her losing her job. In the evening, the family sat down to eat together, and Linda divided the food, preparing to go upstairs. Just then, there was the sound of a door slamming upstairs. Anna was about to go, and scold her daughter, but found her sitting by the stairs playing on her phone. So, who made that noise? Anna took an axe and cut through the chains, opening the sealed door. Inside the room, there was nothing except for some old furniture covered with sheets. Arwen turned off the light and left. In the evening, the couple who couldn't see eye to eye argued a bit. Jigwa went to the living room, and brandished a pistol while, Anna went to the kitchen to find some alcohol. Anna couldn't shake the feeling, that someone was watching her from the shadows, even though there was nothing behind her. In the middle of the night, Arwen got up to have a midnight snack, and Linda, smelling the food, also came over. It turns out, that Arwen is not Jigwa's biological son, but the child of Anna and a pilot. Over the years, the father has never approved of Arwen, leading to an impulsive act, that caught the attention of the police. Linda feels that the father deserves it, but Arwen made things too big, ruining her plans to go abroad, which is why she has been holding back her anger. Everyone wants to escape from this house, leaving Arwen feeling lonely. At this moment, as he was about to pick up the noodles on the floor, he suddenly noticed that the noodles were gone. The siblings bent down under the table to search, but neither of them found the noodle. They didn't notice. There was a figure hiding under the sofa. Arwen always felt that the house was eerie, so he resealed the talisman with tape. Early the next morning, Arwen discovered that the adhesive tape he had sealed yesterday was somehow open. Just then, Anna suddenly came over and called him to eat, wearing a smile on her face, which was extremely unusual. After all, since they moved in, Anna had been unhappy, and even before the incident, she never made breakfast for the children. Everyone just had cereal and milk. Following that, even more strange things happened. Anna actually picked up the food that had fallen on the ground and ate it. The siblings felt as if they had seen a ghost. Arwen borrowed his sister's phone and searched for the purpose of the talisman posted on the door. Online sources say that the talisman is meant to trap souls inside the room. And Arwen also found the story of the previous owner of the house. It is said that the family was poisoned while eating sukiyaki and all four members died from poisoning. Arwen suspects that his mother is possessed by a ghost, while Linda tries to persuade her brother not to overthink things. Anna suddenly decides to go out shopping, saying that they will have sukiyaki for dinner tonight. As night falls, the family of four gathers around the pot, ready to eat. But apart from Anna, no one dares to touch their chopsticks, seeing that no one is eating. Anna asks if the soup isn't tasty enough. Anna brings over a chopped chicken, intending to add it to the soup for flavor. Anna questioned her husband, don't you only like virtuous and gentle women to go out and have affairs? Anna also couldn't be bothered to pretend anymore, since the kids knew that they both had affairs. Why bother pretending to have a happy family? She grabbed the chicken and threw it into the soup. The next moment, Anna cut open her own wrist. She looks like she's likely possessed by a ghost. Jigwa stepped forward and grabbed his wife's hand holding the knife, while Linda took the opportunity to splash hot soup on Anna. Jigwa restrained her and raised the knife to strike Anna. His eyes filled with a crazy look, clearly indicating that the ghost had possessed him. Arwen hurried to the study to find a gun, while Jigwa caught Linda trying to escape and forcefully slammed her head against the doorframe. Upstairs, Arwen shouted his sister's name loudly, but forgot to shoot to save her. He watched as his sister was strangled to death. Linda was already dead, and the next one to be targeted was Arwen. Jigwa walked to the staircase, but Arwen hesitated to shoot. Just then, Linda suddenly got up. She grabbed Jigwa's head and hit him to death. Arwen thought his sister wasn't dead, as Linda seemed to be possessed by a ghost. He turned and hid inside the house, watching as Linda was about to break down the door. Arwen shot through the door, 
cautiously peeked out, and discovered his sister lying in a pool of blood. Arwen was about to escape, but he was caught on his ankle. Immediately after, his parents also approached like zombies, and the handgun was ineffective against them. Arwen hid again in that room. The next moment, he suddenly fell to the ground, and when he regained consciousness, he found himself back at the dining table, where the family of four was happily eating. Could it be that everything that just happened was just a dream? Just as Arwen was about to breathe a sigh of relief, he forcefully coughed up a large amount of blood. The other three also collapsed at the table, foaming at the mouth. It turned out that the family of four reported dead from poisoning was Arwen's family. Arwen poisoned his family and then took his own life, resulting in the four of them being forever trapped in the house, endlessly reliving this tragedy. The fourth story oath. Mac and Manly met at the school swimming pool. Mac was floating in the pool lost in thought, and Manly thought he was drowning. She hurriedly jumped in to rescue him, and this is how their bond began. They dated for eight years. At this moment, Mac, due to a vacation villa project, took Manly to inspect the beaches of Montenegro. He was keeping something very important from her. Not long ago, with a hopeful mindset, Mac applied for a position as an architect in Sweden. Unexpectedly, he was actually selected. Mac didn't know how to tell Manly. On this day, the two went to the shrine to worship the Black Mountain Goddess. Regarding this goddess, there is a myth. The Black Mountain Goddess was originally a fishmonger's daughter, who fell in love with a prince across social classes. However, they faced opposition from their families and society. The Black Mountain Goddess decided to end her life, thus creating a romantic legend that has attracted countless lovers to come and pray. However, in reality, this story is incomplete. Before meeting the Black Mountain Goddess, the prince had a fiancé whom he abandoned the goddess just to have an affair with her. The goddess only discovered the truth after her death. She summoned a storm. The heavy rain slashed the prince like a knife, leaving only bones, showing that the Black Mountain Goddess was not merciful. She punishes lovers who are not honest with each other. Therefore, lovers should think carefully before making wishes, or else they might see things they wish they hadn't. Manly had great confidence in their love, and immediately pulled Mac to make a wish, swearing that they would love each other steadfastly and not hide anything when facing problems. Mac felt guilty. After making their wishes, they started drawing lots. Both of them drew the twelfth lot. Mac glanced at the lot's text, and falsely claimed that the writing was too blurry to read. Mac left with Manly. In reality, the text on the twelfth lot was very clear, stating, your love will endure hardships. If you hide worries in your heart or keep silent, your love may come to an end. Mac felt uneasy, and then his father-in-law called wanting him to take charge of designing a new resort in Phuket. Mac didn't want to work for his father-in-law's family for the rest of his life. He wanted to go to Sweden to pursue his dreams, but he didn't know how to bring it up with Manly. In the afternoon, while Mac was worrying, he saw a woman in black standing on the beach, and she didn't move until evening. This reminded him of the legend of the Black Mountain Goddess, making him extremely nervous. Manly walked downstairs and asked Mac to fetch some water for her. The person in black on the beach had disappeared. Mac carried the water upstairs to find Manly, only to discover that the bedroom was empty, and the tap in the bathroom was running. As he moved to turn it off, he saw Manly pressed against the wall. Staring into the darkness, a woman with a rotting face suddenly appeared. Manly pulled Mac downstairs, but the strange woman materialized, blocking their way at the door. Mac had to open the back door to escape. The rain turned into blades, stabbing his arms and causing them to bleed profusely. Manly approached to inspect the wounds, which miraculously vanished in the blink of an eye. The Black Mountain Goddess threw the signed document in front of them. At this point, Mac had to confess. Last year, he sent his portfolio to a company in Sweden, and unexpectedly, he was accepted. Mac has already taken up this job. Manly devoted her youth to Mac for eight years, and never thought he would leave. However, she was not entirely honest either. Manly's feelings for Mac were fading. But seeing how happy her friends were after getting married, she held on to a glimmer of hope. What if she could reignite her love? After getting married and having children, they had been together for eight years. If it ended now, could she truly find someone better than Mac? Furthermore, the resort job was actually arranged by Manly's father, because Mac couldn't find a job. <laughs> Mac no longer hid the truth. He told Manly, I had already found a job. It was your father's sudden illness that forced me to falsely claim unemployment and stay at the resort because he was afraid of accidents. His daughter had no one to rely on. When your father miraculously recovered, 
I decided to accept the job in Sweden, to escape this suffocating relationship. It turns out, that the two of them had already lost their feelings for each other. Mac couldn't help but feel puzzled. What does it mean to be forever trapped here? He grabbed Manly who ran into the pouring rain, and pressed for an answer. Manly confessed that when they first started dating, I prayed to the goddess that we would always be together. In other words, if Mac leaves Manly, his attempts to work abroad, and all his future plans will fail, because the destiny of the two is already intertwined. Mac pushed Manly into the pool, a familiar scene. It reminded him of their first meeting. The Mac and Manly of that time, sat by the pool and talked for a long time. At least the emotions of that night were real. They really loved each other. The two stopped fighting, sat together and cried. In the end, Manly decided to accompany Mac to Sweden. The story below is titled The Girl Next Door. The protagonist, Abeo, moved to an old apartment to escape his mother's control. Just as he got off the car, he felt dizzy and saw a woman in a red dress falling in front of him. By the time Obeo reacted, the traces on the ground had vanished, as if everything just now was an illusion. He composed himself and went upstairs with his friend. Ignoring his mother's call in the meantime, Abeo went outside to get his luggage, where he saw a sexy beauty, and walked into room 406 across the street. Excited, he went back to his room to leave a note, planning to say hi to the beautiful woman. Abeo exclaimed, never thought that in such a rundown apartment, good things can also happen. His friend advised Abeo, you should quit your job and start trading stocks. You can't rely solely on luck. Without a stable income, life has no guarantees. Abeo is most annoyed by his friends nagging. You work in your own family company. How can you understand the feelings of a wage earner? He's tired of the monotonous 9 to 5 life. <laughs> After Abeo finished speaking, he saw his friend off. He casually stuck the note on the neighbor's door. When Abeo returned to his room, the note had already disappeared. Satisfied, he returned to his bedroom. But suddenly, drug addiction flared up. Abeo rummaged through his backpack for drugs, satisfying his craving. Then he lay on the bed waiting for it to take effect. Suddenly, he heard water running next door, probably a woman taking a shower. Abeo imagined the scene in his mind. The next moment. The woman walked out of his bathroom, then disappeared again. Abeo hurried to the bathroom to check, where he found a note on the floor by the door. The note read, No matter what you hear, do not panic, do not seek help, and do not leave the room after midnight. If someone knocks on the door, or moves around outside, do not respond, do not open the door. It's best to turn off the lights, and avoid making any noise. Abeo thought it was a prank. So he called his friend Akai to complain. He said the woman next door is being taken care of, and doesn't want anyone to witness anything unsightly, which is why she left this note. After speaking, he crumpled the note and threw it away, but he felt uneasy inside. In the end, Abeo still stuck the note on the fridge. In the evening, he was watching the market trends on his computer, when he heard arguing coming from next door. Abeo put on his headphones to block out the noise, and went to the balcony to smoke and relax, but suddenly realized, that the argument outside his headphones, I don't know when, it has turned into an ear-warming sound, Abeo leaned out to sneak a peek, and saw the neighbor woman flirting with someone, the next moment, she looked at Abeo, startling him, causing him to quickly retreat back to the balcony, then there was a knocking at the door, Abeo glanced at the note on the fridge, hesitated as it was already midnight, Afraid to approach and open it, he cautiously looked through the peephole. Abeo turned off the lights, waiting for the sounds outside to fade away, and after confirming once again that there was no one in the hallway, he breathed a sigh of relief. Akai explained over the phone, You left the bag with shoes in my car. Abeo shouted a foul word. Is it necessary to call me in the middle of the night, for such a small matter? Akai heard him speaking softly, and asked if something had happened. Abeo briefly explained the situation. Suspecting that the girl next door was prank, Abeo hung up the phone, laying down on the bed to rest. He dreamt of the woman falling from the building again, when he woke up from the nightmare. It was already the next morning. Abeo put on his clothes to get ready to go out, but noticed that the neighbor's door was chained shut. Abeo found it strange approached and knocked on the door, when suddenly someone inside pushed the door open, startling Abeo, 
causing him to step back. He looked through the door crack, making eye contact with the girl inside. Abeo was startled and ran downstairs to inform the property management that the resident of room 406 was locked in. Could you go and check? Unexpectedly, the property management said that room 406 was vacant. The owner had moved out several years ago and it had been vacant ever since. Abeo thought the management was trying to be lazy, not didn't notice the other person's evasive gaze. He went to a hardware store to buy tools, preparing to enter room 406 from the balcony. Abeo pried open the door and entered the room, where he noticed the decorations and furnishings were the same as his own room. The most eerie thing was that on the fridge. Also stick that piece of paper. Abeo heard sounds coming from the bathroom, so he cautiously went to investigate. To his surprise, he saw another version of himself. When he came to his senses, Abeo had already returned to his own room. The situation just now felt like a dream. Shortly after, Akai called, asking if he wanted to pick up the shoebox. Abeo was not concerned about the shoes now. He told his friend that the neighbor girl had been imprisoned by someone. Akai suggested calling the police, but Abeo was afraid of things escalating. Involved oneself, especially since he had flour hidden at home. Abeo decided to leave the apartment before midnight. As the time approached midnight, Abeo suddenly heard his phone ringing and felt his pocket, realizing he had left his phone at home. After hesitating, he decided to go back to his room. It was already midnight, and Akai was very angry on the phone. He learned from Abeo's mother that, that Abeo was fired from the company due to drug addiction, not didn't resign for dream at all. Akai even thought that the neighbor girl's situation was simply a hallucination caused by his drug addiction. Hearing this, Abeo was ashamed and angry. He tore off the note and threw it away, ignoring the taboo of midnight. He pushed open the door and walked out. The door to 406 was also wide open. The girl was looking at him through the mirror. Abeo felt scared and wanted to leave. But then the girl, wrapped in a bathrobe, walked into his room. The next moment, Abeo woke up from the dream and saw a note stuck at the door, which was a notice about a malfunction in the building. The note stated that the malfunction could cause discomfort. So reminding all residents not to try to identify the source of odors or heat until the plumbing issues were resolved. Avoiding contact with or drinking tap water. You might find other people in your room. Do not greet them or make eye contact unless you receive a notification that everything is back to normal. Otherwise, do not leave your room. These were all strange regulations. Abeo wanted to go out but found the door locked from the outside. He prepared to call the police but his phone wouldn't turn on. He could only shout for the security guard from the balcony, but the people passing by downstairs seemed not to hear. Abeo grabbed something and threw it down, and suddenly the road turned into a forest, and the ashtray he threw returned to its original position. There must be ghosts in this apartment. In the evening, the lights in the bathroom flickered, and the faucet started running water. The toilet was also overflowing with water. Abeo was so scared that he collapsed on the ground. Suddenly, he felt someone approaching from behind, so he grabbed the nearby pry bar. But when Abeo turned around, there was nothing suspicious in the room. Meanwhile, Akai found the previous owner of 406, Lao Bai, to inquire about what was happening in that apartment. From their conversation, it was revealed, Lao Bai used to live with his wife in 406, Abeo's apartment 407. There was a beautiful woman living there, and they gradually developed a relationship. However, Lao Bai's wife discovered this affair, and that very day, Lao Bai slipped a note under 407's door, warning the woman not to come out no matter what she heard. Sure enough, in the middle of the night, Lao Bai's wife came over to cause a scene, and the woman cowered in a corner, too afraid to open the door. Although Lao Bai promised her that he would divorce his wife, he ultimately chose his wife in the end. Lao Bai moved away with his wife without informing the woman, and not long after, did he learn about the woman's suicide? The body of Bao saw when he first moved in was actually Xiao Jian, who used to live in 407. At this moment, Abeo was trapped in the room and unable to leave. The doorknob turned into a burning hot iron block. While Xiao Jian sat on the bed, the woman led Abeo to jump off the building. And shortly after, his family held a funeral for him. But they didn't know. Abeo's soul was still trapped in the house, unable to escape no matter what. Because the issue was not with room 406, but with room 407. Next is the story haunted school. Xiao O is a teacher at an elementary school. She doesn't like this job, but she has to endure it for a living. In Xiao O's class, there is a boy named Nick. 
since the last final exam, he has been missing classes continuously. One chubby student in the class mentioned, Nick was hit and killed by a car on the street. And there are rumors, that the teacher on duty at night, as they passed by their classroom at night, once saw Nick sitting at a table studying. <laughs> Xiao was worried about Nick, and goes to consult with other teachers, but everyone advises Xiao not to get involved, because everyone in Nick's family has issues, his father used to attend this school as well, not only was he an alcoholic, but also a drug addict, and eventually impregnated a female classmate, resulting in his expulsion from the school, as for Nick's grandmother, she is also peculiar, but too many absences would lead to disqualification from exams, after contemplating, Xiao still decides to go and have a look, Upon entering the yard, she immediately smells a foul odor. There are some animal corpses in the jar. Nick's father and grandmother find out that Xiao O is a teacher, and specially bring her a cup of tea. But the tea is murky and unpleasant. Xiao O dares not drink, and the two explain that Nick has fallen into drug addiction because his family doesn't give him money. He stole things and ran away with friends. And this morning, Nick even hit his grandmother, showing extreme brutality. He beat his grandmother black and blue. After the old lady finished speaking, she opened her mouth and showed it to Xiao O. Teeth almost got knocked out. Nick's father said he had already called the police, but so far there had been no progress. Afterwards, Xiao O noticed a man trying to peek under her skirt, so she hurried back to the school. It happened to be Xiao O's turn to be on duty today, and she vented to her best friend about what had happened. Then, the principal walked into the office. Xiao O discreetly replied to a message under the table with her phone. The principal nagged, don't forget to write a report after your patrol, and contact the security guard if there are any issues. While Xiao was envying her friend who was out having fun, the principal couldn't stand her seemingly indifferent, and couldn't help but scold Xiao a few words. Soon, night fell, and the school became quiet. Xiao lay on the office desk watching paranormal explanation videos. She was engrossed in watching, her mother suddenly called. Her mother kept nagging, asking her to work hard and get a permanent position quickly. Xiao O pretended the signal was bad, and hung up the phone. Just then, a strange sound came from the second floor. Xiao O wanted to call the security guard, but the guy was drinking, but he lied to Xiao O, saying that his wife had been hit by a car. Xiao O had to patrol the building herself. She walked into an empty classroom, and suddenly remembered the ghost story told by the chubby student. She seemed to see Nick sitting at a desk. Xiao O wiped her sweat and prepared to leave. But strange sounds echoed again. The next moment, a hand grabbed her ankle, terrifying Xiao O. Nick gestured for her to stay quiet. <laughs> Xiao O thought that Nick came to the school to steal, but Nick explained that his family was lying, saying that his father and grandmother wanted to kill him. As soon as he finished speaking, the strange sounds grew closer. His grandmother and father were approaching. Xiao O instinctively shielded Nick and Nick's father turned to shut the door. His grandmother indicated that she wanted to send her grandson go to serve the Buddha in the Tusita heaven, saying a white-eyed wolf like Nick deserved to learn a lesson. Xiao O seized the opportunity, pushed down tables and chairs, let Nick run quickly, but the room's door was wedged too tightly, and Nick fell into his father's hands. Xiao O grabbed things from the table and smashed Nick's father fiercely. She pulled the boy up and fled the classroom. The two of them originally intended to leave the building, but the main door was locked by someone. Xiao O had no choice but to pull Nick into the office to hide. She quickly locked the door and then called the police. However, Nang Shanwang school was in a remote location, and the police were short-staffed and reluctant to come over. Xiao O couldn't help but curse loudly. <laughs> The two could only huddle in the corner, praying for a quick departure. Xiao O couldn't help but ask what had happened. And Nick explained that not long ago, a hermit claiming to be the reincarnation of an arhat was deceiving people into buying his drugs. The deceived grandmother then recommended that special medicinal soup to his father. The mother and son were mentally confused by the drugs. They forced Nick to take it with them. When he refused, he was beaten. And Nick endured months of torment which is why he hadn't been attending classes. During the day, Xiao went to Nick's home to find his parents, and upon hearing this, Nick finally saw hope. That's why he ran to the school for help. Just then, 
the grandmother and father crazy banging on the door. Xiao Oh told Nick to hide, while she went out to deal with them. <laughs> Unfortunately, the two did not believe. Xiao Oh wanted to make his grandmother sober. Under the sky, where is there a Buddha? Who would let someone harm their own family? The divine beings you see, are just hallucinations caused by excessive drug use. His grandmother became unhappy. Even Prince Siddhartha, offered his wife and child to the old man Su Zhu. Why do you say my Buddha is fake? She directed her son to grab Xiao Oh, ready to give this teacher some divine medicine. Nick didn't want Xiao Oh to be implicated, so he stood up despite the danger to stop them. Nick's father dragged him away, while Xiao Oh's attempt to induce vomiting failed. She now felt dizzy, and soon she also saw the illusion of Buddha. Xiao Oh told herself that it was all an illusion, kicked away the Buddha, and then pushed open a door emitting red light. At this moment, his grandmother was performing a ritual around Nick, with a knife inserted behind the child. Nick's father pulled out a knife, and approached Xiao Oh, asking if she had now enlightened. Xiao Oh pretended to cooperate. Nick's father became increasingly impatient with her seduction, and immediately drove his mother out. He wanted to take advantage of the situation, to get intimate with Xiao Oh. Xiao Oh slowly knelt down, picked up the dagger on the table, and took advantage of his lack of vigilance, physically castrated Nick's father. His grandmother heard the sound, and immediately came over to see, only to find Xiao Oh with a face full of blood and a wicked smile. His grandmother, seeing her grandson resurrected seeking vengeance, she screamed and fled in panic. Xiao Oh approached the helpless Nick's father. After Xiao Oh finished speaking, she killed him. Then, she went to find her grandmother who was blocked by the gate. At this moment, the old lady was still praying for Buddha to save her life. But unfortunately, the gods and Buddhas do not save evil beings, and she ultimately died at the hands of Xiao Oh. The next story is called Dear Grandmother. That day, Manta brought his mother to the riverbank to release animals, but the old lady insisted on having eels. However, the river here was swift and lacked mud, making it unsuitable for eels to live. Yet, the old lady was very stubborn, insisting on going back to the market to buy eels. Manta was not happy about this, as going back and forth would miss the auspicious time. At this moment, suddenly, someone called, sounding like it was about a company matter. When Manta finished the call and turned back, his elderly mother was gone, leaving behind only a neatly placed pair of slippers on the shore. At 3 in the morning, Manta followed the police's instructions, and returned home to wait for news. His daughter, Alan, saw her mother crying, and asked why her grandmother hadn't returned. Manta kept crying without answering, and Alan grabbed a cup and smashed it. Finally, Manta was temporarily stopped from crying. She sobbed as she explained, Today is my mother's birthday. She originally wanted to release animals by the river for blessings, but during a phone call, her mother disappeared. Some people said, they saw her at a stall selling eels in the market, yet Manta searched all day without any news. <laughs> Her friend advised Alan, not to get angry with her mother. She didn't intentionally lose the old lady, but Alan was still very angry, because her mother had abandoned her in the past. If it weren't for her grandmother raising her, she might not have even survived. Suddenly, her friend thought of something. Didn't grandma really like playing hide and seek? Maybe she just hid herself. Alan opened the curtains, and saw someone across the street flash by. The next morning, the streets of the community were quiet and silent with posters all over the walls looking for pets. Alan lay on the bed lost in thought, hearing her mother downstairs getting angry. <laughs> Alan hid under the blanket, not wanting to hear her mother go crazy. The sound of a car engine started in the yard. As her mother drove away, Manta arrived at a spiritualist shop deep in the market. She leaned against the door, and waited for a long time. Finally, it was her turn. Manta had just walked up to the medium, before she could speak, the medium said, your mother is still here, but a little ghost has blocked her vision, causing the old lady to lose her way home, if you perform some rituals, she will return home within three days, but the ritual will cost quite a bit of money, it's up to you to decide whether to do it or not, according to the medium's instructions, this ritual is called the binding feet ritual, find a pair of shoes commonly worn by the missing person, bind them with red and white threads, and place a photo of her on top. On the way back home, Manta must focus her thoughts on her mother, and not get distracted, or else she might bring back something else. Manta safely arrived at her residence, placing the bound shoes on her mother's bed. 
Alan watched her mother do these strange things, she unable to resist complaining to her good friend, both young people thought Manta had been deceived, Alan opened the curtains to let in some fresh air, and once again saw someone at the window across the street, she angrily closed the curtains, the medium had said, that her grandmother would return within three days, but on the first day, there was no sign of her, nor on the second day, as evening fell on the third day, Alan was already irritated because of her mother being deceived, and the creepy neighbor across was peeping again, she held back her anger with no outlet, when suddenly she glimpsed footprints in the yard, and then, Monta came over to inform Alan, your grandmother is back. <laughs> Grandma said she was very tired, and just wanted to rest, but before sleeping, she remembered to greet Alan, telling her not to worry, as she had already returned. The next day, the first thing Alan did upon waking up, was to go downstairs to make sure her grandmother was there. Doubting if everything from last night was just a dream, strange sounds came from Grandma's room, and Alan discovered an overturned porcelain bowl, rubbing against the floor. She approached to pick up the bowl and a gecko crawled out from inside. A bug crawled into Alan's nightwear, causing her to hastily remove her clothes and stomp on the floor. Meanwhile, the neighbor was peeping through the window, frightening Alan back onto her bed. To her surprise, she turned and saw a ghostly face, and the lump under the blanket was moving. Alan lifted the blanket, realizing it was Grandma teasing her. Relieved to see that the elderly lady was unharmed, Alan's heart settled. She lay on her grandmother's lap. <laughs> Acting coquettishly, Alan begged Grandma to sing the nursery rhyme again, the one she used to hear often in her childhood. At the same time, Manta at the office, suddenly received a phone call, prompting her to rush out of the office, and arrive at the river where the old lady had disappeared. It turned out that the police had found the mother's body. What exactly was the old person in the house? Manta immediately called her daughter, but the call didn't go through. At that moment, Alan felt, Grandma grabbing her by the back of her neck, the shadow on the wall underwent a strange transformation. The old woman's head detached from her body and vomited out a pile of eels. Alan hid by the wall, but Grandma asked her, Wanna play hide and seek together? <laughs> Grandma gently explained the rules of the game. I'll count backwards from 20, and if I catch you, I'll cut off one of your ears, and so on, with the final round being your head. After saying this, she started counting down paying no heed to whether Alan wanted to play or not. The girl quickly ran downstairs. Alan wanted to escape through the front door, but the front door was tightly locked, and the window slammed shut as she approached. She could only hide in the bedroom closet, even though it wasn't very discreet. Alan decided to change her hiding spot, picking up the pajamas on the floor to stuff into the closet, deliberately exposing the sleeve to lure grandma in. During this time, the little gecko slid onto her hand again, but Alan dared not cry out in shock. Finally, she ran into the kitchen and hid in the cupboard. Grandma's voice grew closer and closer. Alan saw her figure through the crack, sending a shiver down her spine, waiting for Grandma to leave the kitchen. She was about to push open the cabinet door to go out, when suddenly a ghostly face appeared beside her. Grandma grabbed a knife and cut off her ear. Alan covered her wound and crawled out of the cabinet. <laughs> This time, Alan ran into the bathroom, while Grandma outside was cheating and counting. <laughs> Alan tried to escape through the bathroom window, but to her surprise, the shattered glass cut her abdomen, leaving her stuck in the window. She watched as Grandma caught up to the bathroom. Alan gritted her teeth and flipped out of the window, rushing onto the street. Grandma also ran wildly behind with a knife, Alan clutching her wound dashed across the street. The next moment, a car zoomed by. Monta stepped out of the car, picked up a neatly tied bundle of shoes, and placed it back on the rear seat of the car. But the photo on top was of Alan, revealing that Monta had argued with her daughter years ago, leading Alan to run out of the house, only to meet a tragic end in a car accident. In other words, this mansion only had Monta as the sole living occupant. After the neighbors noticed she was constantly talking to herself, they began to spy on Monta's house trying to find evidence of haunting, but they would never know the truth, as the spirits of Grandma and Alan had already stood behind the neighbors. Next comes the last story in this series, The Unleashed Curse. Prey is a single mother, running a laundry shop, with the neighbors around taking good care of her business. Prey bid farewell to the guests, 
and goes upstairs to find her daughter. Kyo, the little one is hiding in the bathtub playing hide and seek. Prey pretends not to see her, slowly approaching the bathtub. She picks Kyo up, to prevent wetting the clothes, convincing the little one to do homework. While Kyo studies, Prey listens to the radio program while doing laundry. It's quite a coincidence that, today's radio broadcast is about supernatural stories, specifically related to a mother and daughter. A single mother takes her daughter to a temple fair, and as the fair is about to end, the single mother suddenly shouts out that, her child is drowning, pleading for help from everyone around, yet no one around assists her. In the end, the mother jumps into the water herself, but tragically, she only finds her daughter's body. The woman refuses to accept reality, insisting that a ghost took her child away. At that moment, the broadcast suddenly cuts off. Prey goes to check the phone, finding the progress bar at the very end. As if someone skipped the middle part, Prey drags the progress bar back to where it was cut off, where the single mother in the story suspects a ghost. Due to her daughter's strange behavior days before the incident, she always talks about her sister coming to play with her. But recently, no one has visited at all. Prey was engrossed in listening, when suddenly the screen malfunctioned, and a ghostly figure appeared abruptly, startling her into dropping her phone. Immediately after, there was a knock on the door, revealing the landlord had come to collect the overdue rent. Prey hadn't paid last month's rent yet, so she could only explain that. She had recently enrolled her daughter in elementary school, thus her finances were tight at the moment. This period of time has passed. She must make up for the money. The landlord felt somewhat awkward upon hearing this, as Prey had enrolled her daughter in a private school, and the tuition fees alone were keeping her occupied. The landlord's own children attended the nearby temple school, although she threatened Prey verbally that, if the rent wasn't paid next month, she would rent the place to someone else. But in their hand, they handed Prey a bag of bananas, saying they were bought for Ko to eat. Prey carried the bananas, and went upstairs to turn off the lights, while in the shadows, a wet figure lifted its head. The next day, the principal of the private school came for an inspection. They always investigate students before enrolling them, looking into their daily living environment. The principal reminded Prey to consider schools with lower fees, not just for the child's sake, but also for her own benefit. However, Prey really wanted to give her child the best. After seeing off the principal, a friend sent a message, reminding her not to forget about today's class reunion. At that moment, Ko ran downstairs to help her mother with the laundry, and Prey taught her to shake out the clothes, before putting them in the washing machine, to prevent them from tangling. Ko, from the guest's clothes, shook out a thick gold necklace. Prey glanced at the door, she put away the necklace, and told her daughter that, she would return it to the guest, then Prey took her to bathe. Ko hated bathing the most, so Prey always had to accompany her during baths. After mother and daughter finished getting ready, Prey handed a spare phone to Ko, saying she had a gathering to attend, and might be back late. She cautioned Ko, not to open the door if she heard a stranger knocking. After locking the doors and windows, Prey left, seeing her friends after a long time, with so much to catch up on. Prey expressed that, although the laundry business earned little, it allowed her to have time to take care of her daughter. A friend suggested that, she should send Ko to a boarding school, considering Prey's qualifications, she would definitely find a good job. Prey interrupted Ahong, and asked her to talk about life in Sweden. At the same time, Ko, who was alone at home, was suddenly awakened by a gust of wind, which had opened the closed window. The little girl looked across the window at the other side. The dilapidated building appears eerie. Shortly after, Prey received a call from her daughter, but upon answering, she heard no sound. Prey hurried back to the laundry shop, where the washing machines were still running, and water was still seeping from the ceiling. Prey pushed aside her doubts, and went upstairs to check, finding her daughter lying on the bed. Prey tried to wake her up by calling out to her. Unexpectedly, the blanket was completely wet, and a pair of feet covered in black mud, emerged from underneath. Something on the bed sat up, slowly approaching Prey. The next moment, Ko turned on the bedroom light, and greeted her mother making the strange scene from before vanish. Prey composed herself, and asked her daughter, if she wanted to go to a boarding school. Upon hearing this, Ko immediately refused, saying she didn't want to be away from her mother. Prey was actually just joking, and quickly changed the subject, asking her, what she had done today. Prey was taken aback at the mention of a sister, 
As there was no third person in the house, K.O. explained that, the sister lived in the building across the street. Prey found this strange, but her attention was quickly, diverted by a call from the principal. They had agreed to pay the school fees next week, but the principal suddenly changed it to tomorrow, and it started raining suddenly. All the clothes Prey had hung out to dry got soaked. She handed her phone to her daughter to watch cartoons, before going to talk to the landlord. She gave the landlord some money first, pleading for a few more days. The landlord's daughter casually asked, Are my clothes washed? Prey explained that they got wet in the rain, and she would wash them again, and return them tomorrow. The landlord and her daughter found this odd, as it hadn't rained today. How could the clothes have gotten wet then? Prey, puzzled by this, returned to the laundry shop, where she saw a crowd gathered at the entrance. K.O. was standing there crying. It turned out that Prey had pawned the gold necklace to pay her daughter's school fees. The pawn shop owner recognized the necklace and reported it to the original owner, who had come to demand it back. Prey awkwardly explained that she had already paid the money. <laughs> Prey found herself in a predicament, with her daughter's crying echoing in her ears, making her particularly irritable. Prey decided to take her daughter away from there, temporarily escaping. She first ushered Kao into the bathroom for a bath, then went to pack their belongings. Prey quickly noticed that there was no sound coming from the bathroom. She opened the door to check, and to her surprise, her daughter was gone. Prey heard Kao crying from outside the window, and she discovered that her daughter was actually in the building across the street. She rushed into the opposite building to find help, where she found another laundry room. Suddenly, a washing machine nearby started spinning wildly, and a small hand reached out. Prey thought her daughter was in the washing machine, but laughter came from the room behind her. Following the sound, Prey moved forward and found her daughter's body soaking in a bathtub. She held Kao in her arms, crying bitterly. A dripping wet woman appeared. From that day on, Prey moved out. After a few days passed, the landlord came to tidy up the room. She casually turned on the radio, and a voice similar to Prey's was heard, crying to the host. <laughs> Shortly after, a scream was heard on the program, and the movie ended at this point. The prequel Strange Tales of Tuesday, released in 2021, laid the foundation for this sequel, consisting of eight standalone stories of varying quality. Overall, it wasn't particularly scary. The formula involved a lot of supernatural antics, culminating in a final twist and an abrupt conclusion. Many details and foreshadowing were left unexplained, making it more of a casual watch. If you enjoy my channel, please hit the subscribe button.